talking about jobs that restore nature. But this research by Green New Deal also includes jobs in care work. And um, we'll hear a bit more from Hannah uh, about this, but care jobs are green jobs because they are low carbon in that they create very little in the way of climate emissions, but also as we've seen throughout this pandemic, they're absolutely key to supporting our communities and we need strong communities for climate action. And the same applies for jobs in healthcare. And we'll hear from Rob from MedAct uh, about the health case for um, green jobs. And the same goes for education. So we really tonight wanna to talk about broadening our understanding of green jobs, as well as talking about the traditional jobs that, um, that we think of in terms of reducing emissions. But these 130,000 good new green jobs will only happen if the government decides to make it happen. We need the government to put the money in to create and support these jobs right across Scotland that will deliver for climate and our communities. And in just over two weeks time, we will all be voting in the Scottish elections. Um, in fact, today is the last day to register to vote if you haven't done so already. Um, and the politicians that we elect will be responsible for Scotland's recovery from the pandemic, as well as being responsible for tackling the climate crisis. And a plan to create thousands of good green jobs must be at the heart of what the next Scottish Government does. So I'm really delighted to bring you a great panel of speakers this evening, bringing together different perspectives on green jobs from climate and nature to care work and health. So we have Hannah Martin, co-director of Green New Deal UK, um, who did this research showing that 130,000 jobs can be created in two years. We have Suzanne Napier, who is a care worker and a steward at Unite Trade Union, who will talk about um, Unite's care campaign. We have Rob Abrams from MedAct, who part of a great campaign called The Health Case for Green New Deal. Isabel Mercer, who's the Senior Policy Officer at RSPB Scotland, who's going to talk about additional research that they have done on the potential for nature recovery jobs in Scotland. And finally, um, my colleague Ryan Morrison, who's a Just Transition campaigner for Friends of the Earth Scotland. Um, we're going to keep it short. We know that lots of people are spending lots of time on Zoom, um, so we don't expect to have time for questions at the end but please do uh, use the chat box as we go along um, our speakers might be able to answer some questions in there after they've finished speaking um, so I'm going to pass straight on to Hannah Martin co-director of Green New Deal UK thank you thanks so much Caro um, just as you said my name the loudest motorbike just went down outside the window so I hope that you can hear me okay um, yeah, so my name's Hannah Martin. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Green New Deal UK. We're a campaigning group that are trying to uh, support people to organise all over the country for a Green New Deal. Um, and I guess I've been asked to sort of give a bit of an overview to the, the work and also talk about what it means to us, what is a good green job, and also talk about why we consider care work to be green work. Um, so firstly, I mean, we did this work because we want a Green New Deal. We want a massive investment program all over country and in every part of our economy to tackle climate change and climate breakdown and to support people um, to get out of the terrible situations that are a result of rampant inequality. Um, you know, for us, it really doesn't make any sense to have so many people out of work when there's so much good work that needs to be done and that we need for our communities to thrive into the future. Um, you know, mass unemployment is not inevitable coming out of this pandemic. And if we had governments, the Scottish government, the Westminster government that had the courage of their convictions to invest properly in the sectors that we need to thrive and grow and decarbonize, we could be seeing a very different story being told as a result of you know, the hardships that people have gone through. Um, so that's kind of why we did this report, is sort of to show just even at the, be the beginning of our vision, what, what is possible. Now, this report doesn't isn't a kind of exhaustive list. It doesn't necessarily say that 
these are all the jobs that could be created. In fact, we think many, many more could be. This is just saying, well, look, even just looking at the data we have already, we know that 130,000 jobs could be created in Scotland. 1.2 million jobs could be created in the whole of the UK in just two years. And those jobs would more than account for jobs that will be permanently lost due to the COVID pandemic. Now, obviously that requires training, it requires transition, it requires lots of support for different communities that are transitioning in and out of different types of work. But what we're saying is that the level of our ambition is currently incredibly low and it could be so much higher and we could strive for more. It's why it's so important to take action in advance of the Scottish elections. Um, just to kind of give a bit of a sense of what the report covers, we look at two kind of major types of work. So care work, covering um, childcare and adult care, and um, green infrastructure work, covering kind of covering kind of low and zero carbon employment across the economy. And that would cover jobs that you might more traditionally think of as good green jobs. So wind turbines, insulation, retrofitting, um, better public transport, those kinds of things. Um, so, and the, and the Scottish regional figures that amount to the total that um, Caro talked about have been delved into by Faux Scotland very thoroughly to make them as relevant as possible to the Scottish context. Um, and I think that what we're saying here is, you know, if we were to want to absorb a, a huge amount of investment tomorrow in a bunch of green jobs, these are the sectors that we would prioritise because not only do they get us towards our climate targets and our emissions reduction targets, but they also invest in underinvested sectors like the care sector, which are in a crisis. And if the pandemic has shown us nothing else, it's that a kind of privately run care system where people are paid way under the minimum wage and are not treated well and don't have job security and don't have unionization as much as they should, um, you know, Though that is that is a care sector that's not as resilient as it needs to be to deal with the kinds of issues we might be facing into the future. So I wanted to explain a little bit more about kind of uh, what we consider to be a good green job, because it is obviously a low carbon job in the traditional sense, but actually green jobs also really should include jobs that sustain life, that create a kind of happy, healthy community. Um, done by the public. And we recognize, you know, so, so much has kind of been talked about around the importance of key workers during this pandemic, for example. But do those people get, you know, a decent income? Do they get job security? Are they give, being given opportunities for progression, for training? Are they working healthy hours, not too many and not too few? Are they doing satisfying work that helps you know, us all learn and make use of existing skills? Are they being given an employee voice and some level of autonomy and participation in the work that they're doing? Um, and are they working in decent conditions at the very baseline, you know, sick pay, holiday pay, unionization, and other non-pay entitlements? Those are the kinds of things that would encompass a good green job. So we're not talking about a massive uptick in zero hours contracts jobs to fulfill a short term need to decarbonize our economy. We're talking about long term, sustainable, good work that everybody deserves to have access to if they want it. And that obviously has to come with an uplift in our, in our, you know, um, in our benefit system, We've worked with NEF on the proposition of a kind of living income to better support people who are not able to work. Um, but I think that our focus at the moment is on, yeah, kind of expanding the vision of what a good green job could be. Um, and as part of that, we included social care because, you know, care jobs are inherently low carbon and they're central to supporting healthy, thriving and sustainable communities. Um, and also, as I said, it is a sector that is chronically underfunded and failed by successive governments. Um, and I think that, you know, if we want a, if we want an, a kind of recovery that is jobs rich, jobs rich, addresses real need and reduces environmental impacts, investment in care feels like a really prime candidate to make that happen. Some recent figures from the Women's Budget Group suggested that pound for pound, 
investment in care work produces 2.7 times the number of jobs as would be generated by investment in construction, for example. Um, also, care work is highly localised work. Um, you know, our report accounts for the greening of transport, but, you know, we expect the environment, environmental impact of people moving into care work to be net negative. Um, and obviously the wider um, society and economic benefits of a really properly resourced care sector outweigh any other impacts at this stage. So I think it's a really exciting time to start talking about green jobs, not just as hard hats and wind turbines, as important as they are, but as meaning something really fundamental to how we look after one another and how we support one another through a, a time of great change and great insecurity. And the care sector feels really vital in that. So I hope that you enjoy the rest of the event. Um, if anyone's got any questions on the report, I'm sure we can answer them later. Um, and I've been asked to pass on very aptly to Suzanne, who's here to talk about um, her role and the care campaign um, as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Hi there, thank you very much for that, Hannah. You've spoken an awful lot about some of the things that I had jotted down, but um, I'll, I'll press on. Um, I'm speaking tonight in the context of my role as a workplace rep um, in the care sector in Scotland. Um, and this is a wee bit about how um, we envisage uh, the future um, sector and, and the positive changes that can come about. I've worked most of my adult life in health and social care and currently, um, without doubt, it's um, at an all-time low. Uh, the care sector was facing challenges, as Hannah had um, noted there, before the pandemic, a uh, lack of government funding, subsequent uh, local council cuts to this sector resulted in the race to the bottom. And I'm sure that's a phrase that uh, a lot of us will be familiar with. Organisations within the sector cutting corners to get contracts from local councils by promising them that they could do more with less money and the knock-on effect of this, uh, basically plain to see, staff are expected to deliver the same level of care to the people using the services as they did prior to the cuts. Um, another example of the disregard for care workers is um, the unacceptable fact that many were basically neglected and left without statutory guidance. Um, when the pandemic struck. Uh, um, as a union, Unite um, had many reports of managers expecting workers um, to support individuals who had tested positive for COVID without the proper PPE. And um, some managers um, were reputedly um, holding on to PPE and expecting um, care workers to reuse um, the protective equipment um, when really it wasn't fit for purpose. Um, there was actually several workers um, really facing a disciplinary action um, for refusing to uh, go into um, premises that were um, really, really unsafe, unsafe practices, um, and it would have threatened their health. And this outrage uh, prompted uh, the launch of Unites Who Cares for Carers, um, we knew at night that we, uh, Unite that there was many issues happening concurrently uh, and we needed to identify the issues that were most common, uh, those that were affecting most workers. So we launched a survey. Um, it included a number of issues like access to PPE, terms and conditions in pay and sickness absence. And it was vital that um, workers not be penalised for COVID-related absence and more. So the survey identified a number of issues that we campaigned around um, and received positive results for workers who needed them as a matter of urgency. And the gains um, for care workers increased their union membership for uh, more than 400 um, strong it was also at this time that um, reps from different organisations came together to form a care combine um, and part of that came care combine where we put together the spine of what was to become our political campaign to revolutionise the sector. And we are currently campaigning um, around three important issues. Firstly, the establishment of sectoral and national bargaining for all carers not covered by existing 
um, and agreed bargaining processes to ensure uh, that standards are met and every carer receives the best pay and conditions. Secondly, the development of a professional, skilled, user responsive national care service to oversee and regulate the sector and ensure the high standards are met. And lastly, uh, we're campaigning that a body be for, um, formed involving client groups, trade unions, employers, local government, Scottish government, with a clear mandate to drive through the changes necessary to make a national care service work. Uh, the campaign is still ongoing and so far we've received some cross-party public support from the Greens, Labour, Conservative and the SNP party. As well as those demands, we're now fighting for a minimum of £15 an hour for all workers in the sector and a minimum, a minimum floor of terms and conditions for all social care workers, which includes two 30-minute paid breaks, access to sick pay, enhanced sick pay, and a consistent provision of pensions. It we're encouraging everyone to take an action and email their MSPs. And uh, there's going to be a link put in the chat, and I would ask you please to pass this on to colleagues, friends, family, and ask them to email the, the MSPs. Um, now, we're acutely aware though, that within uh, the demands for a national care service, there has to be a guarantee that these jobs will be green jobs. Um, jobs, as um, Hannah said, jobs that are decent, jobs which sustain development and society. Um, expanding our um, infrastructure of social care presents enormous, enormous potential for uh, job creation. Uh, particularly in female dominated sectors, thus promoting gender equality, um, redressing socioeconomic inequality, and alleviating poverty. Surely, the aim of any decent forward thinking government and, and society is to alleviate poverty. Um, Hannah spoke a bit the, about the data from the launch, highlights the fact that about 60,000 new jobs in the sector could be created, and that's something that we in Unite the Union are fighting for. These jobs created not only will give people in Scotland careers and jobs to be proud of, it will guarantee that the individuals requiring care will be given what they're entitled to. That is the best possible service. It's our vision in Unite that the future care sector will be staffed by highly paid, professional, and unionised employees. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, yeah, really important to think about the quality of the jobs that we're creating. We don't just want green jobs, we want good green jobs that are well paid, that have the right to collective bargaining they have good terms and conditions, really important um, to hear that. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, and now I'm going to pass on to Rob Abrams. Rob uh, works at MedAct and is going to tell us about their great um, campaigns around the health case uh, for green jobs and the Green New Deal. Thanks, Rob. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much, Suzanne, for that. That was really inspirational, the work Unite, um, that Unite is doing. Um, around the care sector really needed. Um, my name's Rob, I'm the Climate and Health Organiser at MedAct. Uh, I'm standing in this evening on, on behalf of a member of ours in Glasgow, a GP who unfortunately couldn't make it uh, last, last minute tonight. Um, as was mentioned, um, we've just recently put out a report called the Public Health Case for a Green New Deal in which we go over um, sort of both the public health case from thinking about what the benefits of creating good well-paid green jobs could be and also um, what sort of benefits there could be in terms of uh, the problems that there are in the NHS with staffing and um, how, that, how, how that could help. Um, there should be a link going into the chat really soon. But um, just to sort of explain where how, how that report came about, um, about a year ago during the start of the pandemic, many members of our network, health workers from all over the UK came together because um, shortly before the pandemic, there were a series of reports that were released that showed um, that over the last 10 years in the UK that 
despite what we might think, despite what we might, you know, uh, see sort of claims by politicians and entrepreneurs and billionaires, that actually health standards across the UK have been stalling and even declining in many regions and health inequalities between different parts of the UK, uh, based on region, based on class, based on gender, have been only widening, not only over the last 10 years, but arguably over the last two or three decades as well. And it kind of really just like goes against this myth we have living in neoliberal capitalist Britain. You know, we like to believe that we're always progressing and that standards of living are always improving. It's the biggest lie that sold it to us. And many of our members in MedAct um, who work in all different parts of the NHS um, have been seeing this on, on the front line. And, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was this question, how, 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 how could it, you know, go like this? How come the response to it has been so drastic? And it's really not a mystery to a lot of people working in the NHS. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more in just a second about some of the staffing shortages. But just to go over quickly um, about some of the findings in our report um, about, um, you know, where, uh, how, how employment and lack of employment has been harming health in the UK, particularly over the last decade. Um, over the last 10 years, uh, Michael Marmot of the Health Foundation and the Institute for Health Equity and others have been finding that, you know, um, unemployment has been leading to crises, both in terms of physical and mental health, rates of cardiovascular health, uh, rates of uh, mental health have been uh, reaching crisis levels uh, for the last decade. And that's been sort of very tied to unemployment and lack of opportunities and lack of investment in communities all over the UK. Um, something that's been talked about less because perhaps it's a little bit, uh, it's not as, you know, headline grabbing to talk about sometimes because, you know, we always like to go on about unemployed people and how do we tackle unemployment. But the thing we're actually the, thing which I, the, the biggest problem of the last decade isn't necessarily unemployment. And the truth is, is actually unemployment rates have remained pretty steady over the last 10 years. The bigger problem has been in work poverty uh, and the you know, working conditions within work getting increasingly uh, poorer and poorer. Um, you know, I think some of the other speakers mentioned zero hour contracts. We've also seen, um, you know, there, there's been sort of cuts in investments and cuts you know, in health and safety standards, we've seen workplaces, particularly in the gig economy, just turn into completely, you know, toxic and dangerous places to work. Uh, and it's led to this crisis, particularly during the pandemic, where, you know, we've seen, you know, in the care sector and other sectors as well, um, you know, workers um, leading, you know, to transmission rates in different sectors growing rapidly because workers have been under so much pressure to go into work the fear of losing their income because there are no basic protections, there's no sick pay, there's no other benefits to fall back onto. Um, there was a survey by the GMB trade union that found that, um, that during the pandemic, that 61% uh, of the, their members that they had surveyed had been going into work when feeling unwell for fear of losing income, which kind of goes to show just how big the problem has been. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about creating millions of goods, green jobs, the question that we're really trying to answer is what sort of economy we want to build in the future. And it's an economy that's fundamentally based on our needs and not just, you know, our wants. And when it comes to like, what are the things that are most fundamental for our needs, health is one of the most fundamental things we can think of our own everyday health and well-being um, of ourselves, of our families, of our communities. Um, and this really, you know, I, I think uh, Hannah started talking a bit about, you know, the need to redefine what a green job is. And, you know, this idea that a green job isn't just, you know, people in hard hats building wind turbines, but also, you know, it's people working in low carbon, uh, potentially zero carbon sectors, which, you know, help build what we fundamentally need, a care economy, one that is, you know, based on this idea of social cohesion, creating structures that allow people to care for one another. Um, and this is why, you know, we're in, in our report, you can see that we're really calling for uh, jobs in the NHS, particular jobs such as mental health nursing, uh, ha home visiting, and uh, mid midwives, jobs such as roles as such as those. We're calling for investment in those particular jobs um, because, you know, not only are they ones that we really desperately need uh, in terms of creating a care economy, 
Um, they're, they're ones that we're seeing extreme, uh, you know, short staff shortages in right now. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, talking about um, how we got to the, 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 you know, where we are with, with COVID-19 and the pandemic so far, um, bef even before the pandemic, there were around 84,000 full-time equivalent staff vacancies in the NHS across the UK. Um, and then when we're thinking about Scotland, there were 4,000 nursing vacancies in Scotland. That is a staggering number of people that we didn't have in line to help, you know, um, to help um, to help battle the pandemic that epidemiologists have been saying for years was just around the corner. Uh, and it just goes to show how, to be completely honest with you, how criminally negligent the authorities and the government were in handling all of this, not just directly on COVID-19, but, you know, just refusing to prioritize our health and well-being over the last decade. And, you know, um, this is what, this is sort of should really form our, you know, an indication for us where, where the struggle should be in the next, in the coming years and where we should be fighting. Uh, there's a real, real need to raise up the voices of people working in health and care um, people working in a direct response. I don't really like this term frontline for the, thing, the things it kind of implies. The people working on the direct response. Um, we need to support workplace organizing. And we need to join up the links between these workplace struggles over pay, over conditions, and also climate change. And the need to create a green caring economy that helps us in building the kind of society that we need and to build a transformative Green New Deal. And also for that, we need cross-sector solidarity. Um, you know, a lot of us in different sectors have been working in our own silos, and it's really time that for, for the cause of fighting for a just transition that we'd be linking up our struggles, you know, from the NHS through to people working in, you know, the energy industry and others. Um, and I think this is how we really build an unstoppable movement uh, for the Green New Deal that we need. So. Um, you know, I really urge you to read the public health case for Green New Deal. Um, and also um, on Thursday, uh, our group in Glasgow is going to be hosting, together with FO Scotland, uh, the Cl Glasgow Climate and Health Hustings will have candidates coming from all the five uh, main parties. There should be a link going in the chat for that as well in just a second. Um, so yeah, please do join us for that as well. And um, thank you so much for uh, having, having us and making a space for the health voice to be heard. Uh, thank you so much, Rob. Um, I'd like to pass on now to Isabel Mercer. Um, Isabel works at the RSPB and they have done uh, some additional research. Um, like Hannah was saying earlier, you know, these 130,000 jobs are, uh, you know, we, we know that there, <laughs> there are more. People are already putting in the chat some sectors that are not included. There's huge potential. Um, and so Isabel is going to talk to us about work that they've done on the potential for nature recovery jobs in Scotland and the importance of nature um, for, for the climate, but also for our health and well-being, um, as other speakers have talked about. So I'll pass on now to Isabel. Thanks, Caroline. And uh, hi, everyone. I'm really pleased to be able to join in tonight. All the talks so far have been really thought provoking and it's, it's so interesting hearing about all these different kind of evolving definitions of what green jobs are so yeah it's just it's been really fascinating and I'm going to talk a bit more about nature-based jobs specifically um I guess first off I actually just wanted to segue a bit from that inspirational talk um that Rob just gave about health jobs and just touch a bit on the links between nature and our own health and well-being because I think that's something that people have become a lot more aware of over the last year in the pandemic. That, you know, during lockdown, we've had a lot of people really noticing and connecting more with wildlife and nature in their local areas and really noticing the positive benefits of getting out into nature. But the, actually, the flip side of it is that for some people, they've really realised that they do not have access to a lot of nature rich green space in their local area. So particularly in a lot of urban areas. And that's made the kind of challenges of the pandemic and the lockdown all the more difficult for them in their experience. So I think that's been a really important um, kind of theme that's come out of the last year. And we know that there's this huge body of evidence that talk, that, that shows us the um, kind of mental and physical health benefits of getting out in nature. 
And actually, I just wanted to mention a project that RSPB Scotland's just um, involved in at the moment. So we've partnered up with GPs in five practices across Edinburgh to pilot something called our Nature Prescription Scheme. Um, and I'll pop a link to a, a great video about it in the chat after my chat after my talk. But um, it's something we've actually trialed on Shetland and it's been really successful. So it's great to see how it's going to take um, take place in an urban environment. But it is basically means that GPs can actually prescribe um, activities that allow people to get out in nature. But not only that, to really kind of connect with nature. So specific activities that um, help that connection to evolve um, as, as part of a patient's treatment. So that's a really kind of exciting project that, that shows the benefits um, about getting out into nature. And I wanted to start off with that because I think that we're starting to really better understand the very important role that nature plays in our lives, in our economy and in our society. And, you know, Rob was talking there about um, green jobs being about actually what future, what does our future economy look like? And that future economy has to have nature and thriving nature right at the heart of it. But at the moment, we know that nature is not thriving and we know that actually we're in a nature emergency as well as a climate emergency. And um, a major UN report found just a couple of years ago that the rate of global change in nature during the past 50 years is unprecedented in human history. And one million species could be at risk of extinction within decades if we don't deliver transformative change to the way that people interact with the natural world. And I think that sometimes we think this is, you know, a global problem, but actually Scotland's got all this amazing wildlife and landscapes. And that really is true, but nature is very much in trouble here as well. So actually 49% of species have declined and one in nine is now threatened with extinction from Scotland. So this means that we really do need transformative change to deliver nature's recovery, as well as tackling the climate emergency. And as with some of the other issues that have been touched on tonight, it's really vital that this is one of the kind of key issues that the next Scottish government takes urgent action on after the election um, and it's really good to see people kind of pushing this topic up the agenda um, before the elections um, but we just haven't made enough progress on it yet and I guess the good news is that there's a lot of shared solutions to some of these challenges so for instance investing in things like key habitats like uh, native woodlands, uh, peatlands and uh, coastal habitats. These habitats store a lot of carbon as well as supporting wildlife so there's a lot of shared solutions between the nature and, and climate emergency, and it's, it's vital that that's at the heart of the green recovery. And I guess also just to get across that the need for a just transition also really applies to a lot of nature dependent sectors. So things like agriculture, forestry and fisheries, these sectors are really at the forefront of the nature and climate emergencies because they're very dependent on a healthy environment, on healthy nature. And they're going to feel the impacts of things like temperature rise, more extreme weather events and less healthy soils. But equally, there's huge opportunities for those sectors to do more for nature and climate because they're all about how we manage our land and sea. So as part of the green recovery, we need to just not only increase the nature sector. So I'll talk a bit about the research that we commissioned and, and the nature jobs that actually are kind of targeted at biodiversity loss but also by starting to provide the support for um, existing sectors like agriculture to transition. Um, and quickly, just in terms of how we kind of get nature's recovery, how do we achieve that? Well, RSPB Scotland teamed up with the Scottish Wildlife Trust and WWF Scotland, um, and we published a report last year, which again, I can, I can pop the link in the chat. But um, this set out a roadmap for nature's recovery across Scotland, and it consists of 11 key actions. So these are the things that we're really hoping to see in party manifestos ahead of the election. And we've already seen a few of them come up, which is fab. Um, so we had an economist look into how many jobs this could potentially create. And we found that investment in just five areas of the plan could create upwards of 7,000 jobs over 10 years across Scotland. And these would be both direct and indirect jobs. And as um, has been said a couple of times, I don't want people to think that that's it. That's not it. That's just five areas of one plan. And actually this indicates there's gonna be a huge potential for the nature sector as a whole to grow over the coming years. 
Um, but I just wanted to touch quickly on a couple of like um, of the actions and what those jobs would actually be. So one of them would be helping um, agriculture to be more nature and climate friendly. And a critical um, action as part of that is to scale up the existing rural advice scheme. So that means that basically getting more people out on the ground to provide quality tailored advice to farmers, crofters and land managers about how they can reduce their emissions and make more room for nature. Um, and these are kind of roles in and of themselves, but they also would help to make that wider shift for the sector that I was talking about. Another area where there's strong potential um, for job creation is in peatland restoration. So peatlands are kind of one of our biggest natural assets in Scotland. Um, and they support important wildlife, but they also store huge amounts of carbon when they're healthy. But at the moment, 80% of Scotland's peatlands are degraded, and that means that they're actually emitting carbon. So there's a big challenge ahead to restore all of those habitats, but that's also an opportunity as it requires skilled workers out on the ground, like ecologists to do surveys and skilled contractors to carry out the restoration work. And similarly, there's jobs in native woodland expansion. So that's another key action for nature and climate that would provide specialist jobs in woodland management, restoration and expansion. So I hope that kind of gives you a bit of a flavor of the types of jobs I'm talking about. Um, and just to finish off, I just I wanted to come back to the fact that um, these jobs would create many wider benefits for society. So you know, we've talked a lot about what makes good work, what makes a good green job. And I think part of that is also about the wider benefits that those jobs would contribute to society. So we're talking about, you know, cleaning up our air and drinking water, making our soils healthier and Im improving our health and well-being, as I touched on at the start. So, um, yeah, that was kind of all from me on the nature jobs topic. And, and as I said, I'll pop a few uh, links in the chat. Thanks. Hello, thanks. Um, I've been it just came up that I should unmute myself. So I think that's my sign to go next. I'm just going to make sure we've got um, the sign language up with me. There we go. Um, yeah, I mean, this has been amazing so far. Um, and I'm really grateful to follow the people who've came before. Um, and I really just want to start by kind of contextualizing what I'm going to talk about, which is a bit more in those Kind of traditional green areas that we hear about in transport and energy and i just want to kind of contextualize that we're in the middle or we are looking towards two massive challenges and essentially over a year since the beginning of the pandemic you know the vaccination program is it's given us that hope that we might be on the road to a recovery um, and that that means that politicians um, are starting to think about or will be in discussions for how we rebuild the economy afterwards to create new opportunities for people to work and for communities to thrive. But at the same time, we're over a year into the crucial 10 years for action signaled by the UN's climate scientists. And that means it's now, not in the future, that we need to see the transformation of key sectors to reduce our emissions and the phasing out of polluting industries. So all around us at the minute, you know, politicians are saying they want to build back better. Um, and we even you know, hear from fossil, fossil fuel companies that you know, their plans to continue extracting more oil and gas are somehow part of the, the green energy transition. But we don't have time to waste on those kinds of rhetoric or gimmicks. And actually, the answer to both the challenges that we're facing now, and I think kind of came through as a common thread, is to put people and planet at the heart of the investment and policies and the way that we're beginning to shape our economy, thinking ahead for 10, 15, 20 years. And I think, unfortunately, too often the approach of politicians is to listen to big business, um, private interests about and to find out what their priorities are, even though we've seen that fail repeatedly. Um, companies and even entire sectors of our economy have been too slow to decarbonize. Uh, bosses use their lobbying to, res to resist the kind of strict conditions that would force progress on this or radically improve working conditions. And then meanwhile, areas of growth like renewable energy generation haven't led to the kinds of opportunities for workers and communities with manufacturing opportunities and profits largely swept out of Scotland while oil and gas workers are forced to work under increasingly precarious conditions. And we can no longer continue with that system that puts those companies' profits ahead of 
both people and planet and we need to reprogram it so that the system works for the public good. But at the minute, the current Scottish government's economic plan is not fit for that purpose. It was written before COVID-19, it was written before the climate emergency was declared, and it doesn't acknowledge either of those two challenges and what needs to happen. And that scale of change means we need to see that approach completely overhauled and a new strategy for how we manage the transition in a way that's fair and creates new benefits for workers and communities. And I'm, I'm talking about energy and transport because in, in nowhere is that more urgent than in those sectors. Renewables have grown rapidly in Scotland, but are still only just a quarter of our energy use in total. And too much of our energy for electricity, heat in our homes and power in our transport still comes from fossil fuels. Um, we know that to limit further climate breakdown, we need to leave fossil fuels in the ground. But the Scottish Government still supports drilling for every last drop of oil and gas in the North Sea. So we need our political parties to support an end date for new oil and gas that's in line with our international climate obligations and gives us a real sense of where we're headed as a country. And then we must grow the renewable alternatives, committing to all energy generated in Scotland being renewable by 2030. Um, but at the minute, our energy systems, this complicated patchwork of private companies whose key priority is profit. And in many cases, those companies are the publicly owned companies of governments of other countries. As a result, we haven't seen those full economic opportunities that renewables could bring and are too often led by those industries which are looking to delay the conditions that would bring them here and encourage electrification. So our solution for that is to introduce Scotland's own publicly owned energy company to shake up that energy network, giving it the power to develop new wind, solar, tidal and wave projects, encouraging them to provide that energy at affordable prices supporting people who live in fuel poverty, and also prioritizing the local supply chains to create thousands of jobs and specifically targeting and supporting those workers who are in fossil fuel industries today. And in transport, that sector alone is responsible for one third of our climate pollution as a country. And those emissions have stayed stubbornly high because governments have failed to tackle the car dominated transport network. Um, public transport's too often unreliable and, and insufficient. Uh, we see private bus operators reducing their services to rural communities in order to compete with one another for some of the busiest routes instead of serving those other areas that also need those services. But, and buses have a key role to play in reducing our transport emissions. They're a key service largely used by people in lowest income and should be run in the interests of passengers and communities. We're calling for this new parliament to extend free bus travel to all, starting with a trial in Glasgow in the lead up to the UN Climate Summit in November this year, and parties should commit to supporting local councils to run their own bus services. We need old buses, old diesel buses to be replaced with electric models, and we need to increase the numbers that are there even more. And there's a huge opportunity in that to reduce our emissions by improving a service that's used by, the most, by those on the lowest incomes and prioritizing the creation again of skilled manufacturing by using local supply chains. Those are two key sectors where we need to see change. And it comes back to who, whose interests are they being run in. If we're gonna see that change, then we need to overhaul who we're running them in the interest of. And that starts now by prioritizing people and planet. So the politicians we elect in May are tasked with, with taking that forward, everything you've heard tonight, everything we've been talking about, and ultimately to create new green jobs for all to tackle the climate crisis. This is going to be an overhaul. If we're to see it happen for real and to see a just transition that actually protects workers and communities as well, it's an overhaul of whose interests are currently shaping our economy, an end to business as usual, and putting workers and communities at the heart of decisions about how our economy will look in years to come. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll end by just saying, you know, this isn't something our politicians are going to freely hand over. Those with, with narrower priorities than, than mine and the other people who you've heard from today are on the phone as we speak, setting out their agenda, telling politicians what they want to see. And I think it was as, as Rob said, and as, as others said as well, you know, this is why we need to work together to really combine our strengths. And that's what, why it's so great to be part of this tonight, because I think it's an example of exactly that kind of solidarity that we need to see, where you know, you've got care worker, health worker, nature workers and climate activists sharing that vision of something fundamentally different but what by the common thread and I think that common thread will, will ultimately be a, an economy that's led and shaped by people protecting the climate over corporate profit and I will stop there.
Wow. Um, thank you so much to uh, all of our speakers tonight. It's been um, it's it's been incredible. Uh, I don't think I can do justice to to all of you, but. Um, I just want to sum up with some of the key points that, that came across tonight. Um, I think it was really important to expand what we think of as green jobs. As Hannah said, it's not just the hard hats and the wind turbines, but expanding that to include health, to include social care. Um, and I wrote down a really nice quote from Hannah um, that green jobs should include jobs that sustain life, that create happy, healthy communities. And we talked about those green jobs being good jobs, um, being well paid, being unionized, having good working conditions. The need for public investment in all of these areas, not more privatization um, that, that just leads to, to offshoring poor conditions and profit for a few big companies. Um, desperately needed investment in the social care sector and the health service, as we heard, were both chronically undervalued and underfunded even before the pandemic. Um, and, uh, and I think it was Rob that kind of started that question of like, what is the future economy that we want? What is the future society that we want? Um, and it is fundamentally that picture that everyone has, has painted. It's a caring economy with thriving nature happy healthy communities where we do our fair share of climate action where we put workers climate care communities at the heart of all future decision making and we do have a chance in two and a half weeks <laughs> we're going to go to the polling booths on thursday the 6th of may um, and we're going to be making our uh, casting our votes for the future scottish government and the future scottish parliament and that's only the first step it's what comes after the election that really matters. This government, this parliament will sit for five years. They will be responsible for rebuilding after the pandemic, for putting the investment into these sectors, um, for looking after our communities, for looking after social care, healthcare, climate and nature. Um, and so there were a few actions that were highlighted by people and I just want to um, remind you of them all. <laughs> So first of all, um, Green New Deal UK, look up uh, their data. You can see the green jobs that will be, um, that could be created in your constituency and in your region. That look up tool goes live tonight, I think. Um, Hannah will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, have a look on there and use that in any conversations with your candidates or if it's after the election with your new MSPs to talk to them, what are they going to do to create these good new jobs? Um, secondly, Suzanne mentioned the uh, CARE campaign, Unite CARE campaign, email your candidates tool. Um, please take that, really, really important. Oh, perfect, I just dropped it in again. Um, uh, if you are in Glasgow, you can go along to the uh, health and climate hustings on Thursday night. Um, if you're not in Glasgow, then you can just read the briefing and take all the key points from it <laughs> and speak to your candidates wherever you are. Uh, if the, read the RSPB um, links that went into the chat as well, speak to your candidates about that. Um, and Friends of the Earth Scotland also have uh, an e-action um, which is uh, asking candidates to pledge for a, um, a green jobs recovery. Um, I just want to go back round. We've got a few minutes left. I would like to give all of our speakers, I'm sorry when somebody springs this on you, um, <laughs> I would like to give all of our speakers one last word. Um, so I'll come back to you in order. Uh, that we first went in, if that's okay. Um, and if there was one thing um, that you were, that anybody watching was going to ask either their, their election candidate or their new MSP after the election, what is it that you would want people to say um, to their politicians? So if we can go back to uh, Hannah, I'm just gonna um, 
pause a little bit before you do, Hannah, because I just want to make sure that um, Lou, our interpreter, can um, get her video on, okay. Okay, I think that should work now. There we go. Welcome back, Lou. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, let's spotlight Hannah. Oh, you pressed it at the same time as us, Lou. So yeah, Hannah, what is your one thing that you would want somebody to ask of their uh, politicians before or after the election? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I think the one thing I would ask is, will you commit to a Green New Deal? Um, and I think I would, part B of that is, <laughs> and what are you going to do to make sure it's passed as legislation? Um, so trying to nail people down to the, um, because the Green New Deal is huge, it encompasses many, many policies and actually MPs across different committees and across different, you know, parliamentarians across different um, spaces in and different sectors and different special interests. Everybody could be active in trying to make a Green New Deal happen. So I think um, those would be the things I'd, I'd ask of, of them. I think it's Suzanne's turn to be on the hotspot next. <laughs> Well, for me, it's always about um, health and care. So probably what I would want to ask, is there anything more important than the health and care of our population? Um, we all need it from the cradle to the grave. All of us. So what are you going to do to put more finances into um, making a better health and care sector, a green health and care sector. Great, thank you, Suzanne, so important. Um, Rob? I think the one thing I would ask a candidate, you know, once you've asked them to commit to Green New Deal and a green recovery, I would say, um, Where's the money? Let's see the breakdown of how much you're committing to these changes. Because we've heard like so many empty promises from different politicians over the years. And we've seen the co-opting of our language to suit their own electoral agenda. Um, but we've not seen the actual commitment follow through. I think someone put in the chat uh, a question about, uh, what about all this money they've pledged to the NHS? Where's that gone exactly? That's such a great question. And there are lots of people in the NHS who would like to know the answer to that. Yeah, really important. Thanks, Rob. Um, Isabel. Yeah, thanks. I think I think the thing I would ask candidates is um, if you were elected, what's the what's the thing you would do in the first year to have a really demonstrable positive impact on nature? And how would you ensure that Scotland's economy is transformed so that nature's kind of really thriving, nature's at the heart of it, we're giving back to nature and not depleting it anymore? Thanks. And Ryan? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I'd be saying, essentially, you know, we've had years, last five years, where people were talking about things that we're going to do in transport and energy, and they've failed to make any substantive difference on um, climate or for the workers and communities involved. And I'd be asking them very explicitly, what are you going to do differently? What about what didn't work before are you going to change? Um, and then I think the other thing I'd say would be, once you've asked the questions that everyone's just mentioned there in a row, I'd be asking them for a standing appointment, uh, because after the election, once they're elected, you should still be hammering down their door to ask them what they did about the thing they told you before the election, um, and never letting them off the hook. 
Yeah, absolutely. This is very much the beginning of um, of this conversation. We've got so much more work to do together across all of these sectors, all of these organisations. Um, we've got a really big chance now as we start to recover from um, the impacts of this pandemic and especially as we get a new Scottish government and a new Scottish parliament. Um, so it just remains to say thank you so much to all of our speakers tonight, to uh, to Hannah, to Suzanne, to Rob, to Isabel, to Ryan, um, huge thanks as well uh, to Lou and Marcus, our interpreters. Um, and we're absolutely bang on time. So <laughs> um, I would like to uh, invite you to take all of that away with you um, and do have those conversations with your candidates, have those conversations crucially with your new MSPs whenever they take up the job in the second half of May, because we need to make this happen um, for our communities, for climate, um, for nature, for health, for social care, for each other. Um, thanks very much, everyone.